So welcome back to Shifted Podcasts. Uh, we're here today with uh, Dr. Cheryl Smith Gilman from McGill University, um, who is a, an outstanding pre-service teacher um, for <laughs> future educators to come. So welcome, Cheryl. It's uh, really uh, great to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much. So let's just start off maybe a little bit on on just kind of situating yourself a bit. Like, what, what do you teach at Miko? Okay. So um, I'm the assistant director for teacher education programs for the undergraduate and the masters of teaching and learning. And I'm also a faculty lecturer. I teach um, I teach mostly in the first years, uh, although I teach from year one to year four uh, courses in communication and education, um, mostly all the professional seminars when teachers uh, are in schools. Those are the courses that align themselves with the field work. And I teach uh, one of my favorite courses that I've been teaching for many, many years is uh, kindergarten pedagogy, uh, because that's really my background is early childhood. My research has been in early childhood. Um, and I have just been growing along with the course as changes in education have come about. So I have been growing along with this course teaching it many years, it gets better and better every year with mm -hmm. all of the new uh, new technologies and new philosophies and new programs. So that that's really my baby, the kindergarten pedagogy course. Yeah. And I teach yeah. all the second year students. So I get to know them all. And uh, wow. that really, uh, that really excites me. Excellent. That's really <laughs> cool. I mean, so in, in, in the university, when you're, um, you know, teaching your students and you're going through their stages and stuff. Who are your students? Like, can you describe them to us? Like, who do you, who tends to, who do you tend to have in your classes? Right. So um, mostly we have uh, obviously people who have had background in uh, working with children, who have a passion for working with children. Um, I would say that's probably the norm. CJEP graduate students, many from out of province as well. Uh, interestingly enough, I've noticed in the past two, three years that we have people returning to school. We have uh, mothers, um, a, a young mothers who've had a few kids and they want to come back and finish their education, uh, which is I always find interesting. I love when we get um, the 45-year-old women in class with the 22-year-old women or men. Um, and that, to me, is, is great because they bring their experience as parents. So uh, that, that's also, uh, and they really appreciate it also, especially when they have young children. They say, oh, my goodness, I do this with a child and I shouldn't be doing that. Or I realize how important it is to read to children. So um, that, that's, and I've seen more and more of that. Uh, not tremendous amount, but there, there is more speckling. Um, this year, interestingly enough, too, I've had more males in my class. I had, which is not typical in uh, elementary education. So, in my courses that I teach the elementary uh, pre service teachers, uh, I have four or five males in the classroom, which is wonderful. I, I'm so glad to see it. We need more men in education in the classrooms. Absolutely. So, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. What are the dynamics of that? Like when you have all of these different learners from different environments coming all together what kind of um, culture does it create inside a classroom um, I would say on the whole a very sharing very sharing classroom um, I, I know sometimes uh, when I've had the uh, if we're talking about the more mature students um, and sometimes there are some who have uh, undergraduate degrees and they want to be teachers um, and they come back and do a bachelor of education I've had a few of uh, as well. Um, they're the ones that will um, often um, stay behind, check with me a little more often. They're a little bit more cautious than our, uh, our uh, you know, the typical norm that you get from the, the CJEP levels or, or whatever, but that that's fine. Um, and they do, they really do like sharing about themselves. I find education in general, just going back to that reflective kind of stage um, that, um, the best teachers make those good connections. And when they can connect to family or connect to their past, I think that's a really important skill uh, because we want to do that with children in classrooms as well is to connect to their real lives. So I think that's one of the, um, the areas that I, I, I like to focus on in all my teaching um, and hopefully model it to future teachers is how important it is to connect to 
to uh, the realities of today. I love I love the reflective practice that you're talking about, Cheryl. That yeah, that reflection really is a good informer, not only yeah. for teachers but for the kids. And modeling that is really really important for. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. So let's shift a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. interesting dynamics. You have a kind of an idea of your class and the clientele that you have in front of you. So Mm -hmm. this podcast series is looking at the past year, really, you know, since I guess two marches ago now, I mean, time is flying, but not really. (laughs) Um, What have been the greatest challenges for you with this onslaught of COVID and and the pandemic? How, How have you been dealing with that with your students? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, we, we've all been home for over a year. Um, which has not been uh, the most conducive to teaching. Um, There's nothing like being in front of a class or being with students or students being with each other. Um, So I I think I I would have to say, of of course, we're missing that person-to-person connection. Uh, Teaching is about relationships and about connections, and we certainly are, are missing it, especially in the kindergarten pedagogy course that I teach. As an example, this is a methods course. They're learning skills, strategies, understanding development, what children are capable of. And really, I I think the biggest challenge for me is I've had to be so creative um, online uh, because there's nothing like having hands-on opportunities. um, And we didn't have that per se. Although Learn Quebec did do something wonderful for us with the makerspace online and the students loved it and they got it. Um, but you have been visited my class before and you know how dynamic that is when we're they're all there and we're, we're touching and we're feeling and we're, you know, and we're, we're laughing with each other out loud. For sure, for so sure. there's that that connections that we miss. Um, but we managed, Great. you know, as teachers, we're educators. We manage. Um, so yeah, we're I always think, learning too, eh? Like yeah. we've been thrown back into this learning phase of figuring out how do we create effective online learning environments. Yeah. What, what were yeah. some of your 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 tricks or strategies that you use to create those relationships? Because we hear over and over, if you don't have strong relationships with your students, it's harder for them to be motivated and want to, you know, mm-hmm. see through the course. Right. So having those relationships that are so important, how do you how do you nurture those in an online environment? Yeah, um, and, and I think the, one of the biggest words, uh, pieces of vocabulary, which has always been part of our vocabulary, anyways, is uh, is the is the matter of intentionality. What you have to be so intentional on everything you do. We are, I am, anyways, and I think teachers are also. But because of this online forum and because of that lack of contact, what are we doing online that is in t- so intentional that we get to what we have to get to? So naturally, my teaching style had to completely change. I've taught this course since 2009. So if you just think, I mean, not, but in person, of course, it's changed, it's developed with new programs, et cetera. But I had to really create opportunities for interaction. And I think that that was really key. So instead of having these three-hour classes online, the lecture part was asynchronous. We did a flipped classroom approach. Uh, We came into our Zoom uh, sessions with active hands-on learning and as active as possible and keeping students very busy. And I educated myself as well. I learned about Jamboard. I learned about Padlet. I learned how to do a poll. I've, I've been around a long time. So these were all very new and, in fact, very exciting and very creative. Um, even my students became very creative. Some of their projects that are usually more physical, more um, uh, uh, visual, creative, they had to do things online that blew me away, just blew me away because uh, – I think that was important. So to keep those relationships, to answer your question, lots of water cooler talks, like let's go into breakout rooms and just check in with each other. How are you doing? And I would pretend to be flying around in cyberspace, you know, and just say, hi, how are you doing? I'm checking in with you. I think that's really important. Um, So intentional in keeping the relationships, intentional in in, in what what you're bringing into onto the screen. And uh, we listen zoom fatigue is zoom fatigue the, it, my class was not the only class that they are taking 
So I can only imagine how um, how exhausting it was for them. Oh, I'm sure. No? Yeah, I'm sure, it's totally exhausting. It is yeah. too. Eh? The fatigue of Zoom is real. Um, we've yeah. lived it. We know from experience. So yeah, I I want to pick up on something you had mentioned, Cheryl, about how your students have become more creative um, yeah. or innovative. Could you give us a, some more? maybe some examples about how you yeah. saw that coming to life, yeah. how your students yeah. evolved. Uh, can I give you an example right from the classroom? <laughs> okay. It's too bad. This isn't visual because I would love to be able to show you, but let's try and describe it in words as best <laughs> as possible. One of the, um, as an example in um, the kindergarten pedagogy class is the first thing we do, uh, we speak about is how we envision young children. You know, they're, I, I'll, I'll ask my students right away, um, you know, what do you think of young children? And it's amazing. People still think they're, they're empty vessels. They, they, <laughs> they, they need to be filled. They're little sponges. They're naive. And then we start to delve into some theory around uh, what children are capable of, especially in today's time. What are our four-year-olds talking about and our five-year-olds talking about, et cetera? We develop this image of the child. This is borrowed from the Reggio Emilia approach, something that, that is part of my background. Uh, but it really tells us how we envision the child is how we're going to teach them. If we think a child is naive, then we're going to be feeding them and, and spoon feeding them. If we think a child is creative and capable and interested and, and hands on, well, we're going to provide them with tools and materials and, and, and learning experiences that will do so. So one of the projects that my students typically did when we were in school was create a visual representation of their image of the child. And I usually got beautiful paintings um, of, the, of the child's brain and they would title it, the child is the thinker. And they would make these beautiful paintings or beautiful sculptures as the child is creative. So they, they create these beautiful clay sculptures with, with um, uh, pails of falling into them with words and letters. The pieces were magnificent. My office at school is filled with all these beautiful pieces, um, puzzles that they put to put together, games they put together to show the child is creative, child is unique, the child is deserving, the child is having rights. I had one group of students who created a painting that tied it up in ropes because they were from war-torn countries, these three students, and they, they felt that they were robbed of their right to play, their right to learn. And they told their story. So these wonderful, very impacting pieces. How was I going to create this online? So I charged my students with the same task, but visual. Um, and I had no idea what was going to come about. Um, I, I said, you know, nothing, you know, this is a very deep conversation of how we envision children. Um, and lo and behold, I received beautiful videos, podcasts, poetry read online with music. I was just bloated. There was one that is a, a gallery walk as the child, as an explorer. And it takes you into a museum. I think it's called Art Step, if I'm not mistaken. It's the, um, it's, it's the, um, the platform. You would know better than me, Chris. Um, and they were... It was they took us into a museum of the child and, and the love of nature and, and how, how the child experiences. They were so powerful that I have already curated these and hope to write about this because that's something else that I do. But I, I want to want you, people to understand about digital art, which is something that has also been exposed to me. So in all honesty, I've learned quite a bit that it doesn't always have not all people are artists <laughs> or can create sculpture or paintings and I always accepted that anyways but wow there's a whole other artistic <laughs> world out there yeah um, so I'd love to be able to show it to you one day but it's really I think you would be blown away wow. Um, wow. so that's just an example of how creative students got yes was I pushing them absolutely uh, but in retrospect, when we had that day of celebration to look at each other's work, um, it was quite moving. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, great um, visual in my mind of, of all of these digital artifacts that they created. Mm -hmm. um, and, and was it that open-ended, Cheryl? Like you, you allowed them to choose whatever platform or whatever means yeah. they wanted. But here's my theme. You guys yeah. choose how you're going to show it to me. 
I, I, I would have loved to have suggested something, but I was just as naive as them. Sure. So they went out and they explored some, I mean, some had some, uh, you know, knew how to do videos and things like that, but right. I didn't know what to expect. And they, you know, well, what do you want? And, you know, everybody <laughs> wants answers like, like, like any child. Uh, and these, I consider the university students still my kids right. is, uh, what do you want? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, but go out there and explore, go out. And I think it was very motivating. It was an interesting way to learn. Because that image of the child that they grounded took them through the rest of the course. This was done within the first month of the course. So it grounded them as now that I see the child is capable, as having rights, these all these beautiful themes emerge. Child is capable, having rights, is deserving. One group did a beautiful, uh, beautiful video and, and, and took shots from all over the world uh, of children with music. I mean, it was so powerful. Um, but they, they had all these beautiful themes. I said, well, now that you know they're not empty sponges and naive, let's start planning for the kindergarten classroom. And that's just where the course takes off. So that's, that's that a wake up call for them, right? Like, yeah. wow. Yeah. Like, here, yeah. what's our, what's the student in front of you going to be? And then yeah. figure it out. Wow. That's really yeah. a great idea, Cheryl. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's, let's look at that journey then. So the student goes through the year, their, you know, advancing towards their profession. Mm -hmm. What's, what's the kind of student you want to see at the end of that, that, well, actually I should say what prof kind of professional do you want to see at the end of their journey in, at McGill? Um, yeah. Like, what do you yeah. try to, to, to have as, what do you want to see in that educator? Yeah. Um, besides the knowledge of content and besides the methodology of different sure. teaching strategies, you know, teaching today is so is so challenging um, and so rewarding. Um, but you want, I, I suppose, if every student walks out feeling confident, um, having agency, uh, being able to connect to community within their school, within their within their uh, families that they work with, um, we want them to feel good about networking in an educational environment. Uh, we're looking at this more and more with the new competencies about lifelong learning. We've always believed in this, but now we're making a point of this. Um, so this is something new that we too, as teacher educators, need to instill in our programs. That commitment uh, to continual learning is, is very important and growth. Um, I, I think these are, are key um, elements to ground them as they, they move through because they'll have many different experiences until they find a home or you know, wherever that may be. Uh, professionalism, indeed. Um, and, and thank goodness for the field work and the wonderful teachers that open their doors and let our students come in um, and guide them and mentor to them. And hopefully they have mentored so well that our future teachers will also mentor others. We, this is a, a, an educational community. Um, and importantly, that we started talking about this right at the beginning is that um, that ability to be reflective, to connect to your own life. We do it in our teaching uh, at McGill, uh, in, our, in our courses, is always to make those connections. Uh, again, you're modeling it to make those connections with your students. But um, these, these impact, these touch us deeply. I think when teachers don't get to that point, um, they, 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 they may burn out quickly or they may not, they may, they may not get the meaning. Um, you know, as people say to me, you know, you've been around a long time. And I, yes, I have. I was a teacher for many, many years. And then I went back to school, etc. And I, I even questioned myself, what made me go back to school, you know, and do a doctorate or do my master's and, you know, and after so many years of teaching. And I think that that flame, that fire never stopped. I'm not boasting about myself. I'm just saying you have to be a professional learner. You have to, you, you're not only a teacher, you're a professional learner. Um, and that, that really has guided me through the years and keeps, keeps me excited. So that, that that's, that's hopefully, that's hopefully the steps that they'll take as they, <laughs> as they walk, as they move on as well. Yeah. But like you said, that reflective aspect, I think is, is key yeah. because that will push your professionalism further down the road, right? Through that reflecting yes. on what you've done and maybe I made a mistake doing that and I should adjust this. So, um, yeah. and that reflects too, we want to have in our students as well, not only our pre-service 
educators to be, but also our students as well. Absolutely. Um, so they're yeah. not asking, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know, like when you're exactly. launching exactly. an activity or a project. Um, so we have the new curriculum, okay, that yeah. just came out last week, actually. Uh, well, the English version, I should say. Right. Um, can you tell us what the crux of er preschool education is? Yeah. Uh, well, child-centered. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I think the program is outstanding. I'm so glad that they have included the four-year-olds. They're smart. They can do it. Uh, we need qualified teachers to be able to guide them as they head into school. The crux of the program is a play-based approach on child's global education. We don't have to worry about number, well, we teach them numbers, but we don't have to worry about subject areas. We have to worry about their development. And we all know that when children can self-regulate, when they feel good about themselves, when they can get along with other children, when their language is there, they start to think, they start to inquire, they tinker, uh, they play, they play with purpose. All these beautiful, that what you've taught me also, um, this is a child-based program, and I applaud the Quebec government. I think we are avant-garde in early childhood. Um, I see this helping uh, with situations when daycare, when daycares have been uh, very overcrowded or uh, not overcrowded necessarily, but the sparsity of daycares in some uh, parts of Montreal. Um, this will alleviate uh, some of the, um, the congestion of getting into a, uh, a good daycare Let's put the kids in schools in wonderful environments uh, and, and get them ready and give them those good developmental foundations, develop their domains that they need to go on. And I think the, pro the program is outstanding. Uh, I know a lot of work went into it. And I know that, um, that this is what education is all about. No matter where children go in the world, they play. It's a play-based program. Yeah. I, I totally yeah. agree with you. And I love that idea that play is at the center of all of it, you know, like the, you yeah. get them actively involved in exploring, discovering, you know, communicating, you know, fighting and making up and like life, you know, exactly. These are all life skills. Yeah. I always think skills. that, that <laughs> uh, it should be lifelong kindergarten that we have throughout all of school um, and keep yeah. that same practice alive. Um, yeah which yeah. kind of gets forgotten once we hit grade one. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to, we're going to try something, Cheryl. This is a little different. It's a Q and a rapid fire. Okay. So okay. quick answers. And I'm going <laughs> to give you some myths and just some sentences. And you tell me what you think about them. All right. I'll try. So <laughs> first time, first thing. And these are a lot of things I hear about preschool from preschool teachers and consultants. Should there be a nap time? A nap time. Yeah. Um, I think you have to know your customers. I think you have to know your children. Um, there are some children four years old that still need to have a little nap in the afternoon. Um, I think it's it, it's really uh, the dynamics of the class. I think a rest time is there's nothing wrong with it. Um, mm -hmm. Some children may fall asleep a little bit. Uh, some children will just take a book and just lie in a mat and play or have some quiet times or some quiet games. I think children do need downtime. Absolutely. Um, should I, I, I think it depends on the dy dynamics of the class. You may have a very sure. active mm -hmm. class and nobody needs it, but what if you have one child who still needs that rest time? So right. should we allow it? I, I, I would say yes. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Should preschool look like grade one? No. <laughs> no, 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 no desks, <laughs> no desks. No desks, no blackboards, no whiteboards. Keep them off the screen a little bit. You know, um, I worked a, a little bit uh, during my research in Ganawake, and I worked uh, at a wonderful, wonderful um, early childhood center. Uh, and there is no technology in those classrooms at all, except a camera when children had to do photography. So uh, what are we giving kids? What are we, what are we putting in their hands? What kind of experiences are we giving them? I want us all to move away from uh, the prefab. Um, and it was something that I, I think I learned along the way too. Some indigenous ways of knowing is to connect to the land. 
go outside, go into nature, get away from the colored macaroni and the googly eyes and the okay sparkles you could leave because that's a necessity. But other all, all of that, we don't need it because you'd be amazed how children are more in awe with a mirror and a flashlight and uh, and the natural world. These are these are what interests a child. I taught four year olds many, many years ago. And I remember at the time my father was working as a volunteer at the Montreal General Hospital. And, you know, the x-ray machines that they put up on the wall, you know, they used to look at your ribs. So they were throwing them all out. Everything has gone digital. Correct. And my father said to me, um, you know, the, the hospital's throwing out all these these x-ray machines. He says, and they're, I said, give them to me. So they were little tabletop light tables. Uh, where we brought in the natural world and looked at leaves and, and sketched them and traced them and poured um, sand and drew and wrote letters in them, etc. The children were in awe. I couldn't get them off of this. And this was an old, old x-ray mach- machines. So don't, if you have any, don't throw them out. Well, I told, <laughs> I told teachers too, don't throw away your overhead projectors overhead just yet because they can do the same thing with that light play. It's just the kids love that stuff. Love it. So, love it. We yeah. used to use them to, to, to um, show uh, natural uh, items on the wall or, mm-hmm. or on a piece of paper. And we used to trace them and paint them. And oh, we would so enlarge fun. a butterfly uh, to a massive degree that the kids were just in awe. But just think what we just taught them, you know, how to manipulate light, what shadows are about, the fine motor development, the discussion, the social interaction. Look at all the developmental domains that are in. And it's all playful. Uh, so, it should not look like grade one. <laughs> um, All right. Here's another okay. question. Sh- should preschoolers know how to read and write before they enter grade one? No. <laughs> okay. No. Shall, should we be exposing them to letters and words and numbers? Absolutely. Fun, playful way. Little, little kids love work. They mm-hmm. love to have their little journals and write their their plant, P-L-T-N, that's fine. Uh, you know, th- that, I, I think that you introduce it, uh, mm-hmm. you expose them to it, um, but certainly uh, not to the point that they must be fluent readers or writers. You know, I think if presented the right way, children should know the letters, they should know out the alphabet, they should know some small sight words, absolutely. But we do it in a playful way through song, through music, writing in the sand, uh, creating uh, papier mache names, whatever it may be, all uh, all in a playful, artistic way. So, um, well, do and, they- and that indicates in the curriculum that's what they're saying, right? Because yeah. One of the dimensions is written language, right? So I was like, mm-hmm. hmm, are we trying to get them to write? And then I read further and it said, well, have them play right. You know, like they're at a restaurant and they're taking an order and they're just, it's gobbledygook, but they're yeah. understanding when you write and how you go about it and like the infrastructure of it rather than, you know, Absolutely. does it sound like, uh, is it the right word? Is it spelled correctly? Is it the right grammar? Et Absolutely. Yes. So the focus on language is extremely important, but, the, you know, there is the approach of the complete uh, dynamics of phonemic awareness, the rhyming, the singing, right. all the things that we did when we were little kids mm-hmm. that we didn't even realize we were doing. But this is all attuning the ears, attuning the language to what it should be. Uh, playing with words, uh, even if they don't make sense, schmurly, burly, twirly, furly, that is fine as long as you're hearing it. This is all the beginning of language. And to expose them to language, to write in front of the children, come up and add your name or sign your name to your painting. Um, or what would you like to title it? Would you like to write it or should I write it for you? You know, scribing for children to show them that the words are important when written down. Um, and not only that, letters. Put together, make a word. And that's that's basically what we want to teach them. So we dance to words, we, we move to words, we paint them, um, we write them in a drama center, like you said, we're taking orders in a restaurant. And even, you know, this, this is all developmental. And I would say the typically developing child does come out of kindergarten with some read, some ability to read some words, some, you know, abilities to write their names, some soar. I mean, we I've had five-year-olds who read on a grade one, two level. I have seen that. Um, and it's all part and parcel 
but it's not only in the classroom, it's making partnerships with families as well. Parents should read a lot to kids. <laughs> this is uh, Books are probably, so important. So important. Yeah. 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 That's really amazing. Well, Cheryl, I just want to thank you for, for joining us today for this um, conversation. I think it's a valuable conversation to have, and it kind of orients us where we, we're starting. And I mean, we talked a little bit about COVID, but I really love the stuff that we talked about, about our youngest learners. Um, yes. We got to get to understand them more. And I totally agree with you. I think this curriculum that just came out is is something to be admired and something to be integrated. Um in a, on a much more uh, cross-board kind of um, mm -hmm. way or manner, I should right. say. Right. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Um, and I hope uh, to see you soon. You bet. You bet. Thank you, Chris. Keep well, up you the take great care work. Yourself. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. You too. And um, okay. I hope that we can um, see each other face-to-face -face, uh, in you the bet. New, new school year. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. You bet. Take care. Right. Take Thank care. you well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay.